Okay, welcome back. Part two of the Kasarati Viastros video mini series, I guess. So in the previous video, I introduced all the backgrounds here. So if you want to know what on earth the Kasarati Viastros theorem is talking about and what essential singularities are, then watch the previous video. We covered all this stuff over here. But in this video, we're just going to focus on the proof of the Kasarati Viastros theorem. Let's put this blackboard right down snugly over here. So first of all, I want to reframe the Kasarati Viastros theorem a little bit. Essentially what we can do is we can pick any open disk in our input space over here around our essential singularity and there's a point which maps to some disk around the points we're interested in in the output space. So let's say the radius of this disk in the input space is delta and the radius of the disk in the output space is exactly epsilon. So what we can say is that for some fixed complex number, let's say C in the complex plane, we have that for all epsilon and delta, which is greater than zero, so these are the, the radii of our disk here, um, and we also need to ensure that the disk, and I'll use D star over here just to denote the punctured disk, D star at Z naught comma delta, lies inside of our domain D and because our function is going to be analytic on D and we just want to make sure that our function is actually analytic on our puncture disk as well. Well, given these, there is going to exist some complex number Z in D star, and then we have zero comma delta, such that f of z comes arbitrarily close to our complex number c that we chose over here. And we can write this as f of z minus c. This guy is less than epsilon. So this is what we want to show here. We want to show that this is true for some epsilon and delta that we can pick. So this is how we can just rephrase it a little bit, I guess. And now it's time for the actual proof. So proof. How does this go? Well, first of all, what I'm going to do is I'm going to construct some new sets. So I'm going to call this set, let's call it big E down C. And we're going to define this to be just the pre-image under our function F of the point C over here. So I mean, you have your input space over here. So here's your Z plane and here's your W plane over here. You picked your point C that you like. So right over here. And then what you do is you go back to your input space and you figure out all the points which map to that point C, um, which you want to hit. So I mean, it could be, well, let's say this point, this point, this point, this point, this point, and then your essential singularity is lying somewhere. Maybe it's lying right over here, right? So this is your Z naught, and all these blue dots over here, that's the pre-image of the C, so that's going to be EC, all those little dots there. All right, so this is just the, the picture. Now, there's a few things that can happen with this set EC. First of all, EC, could have what we call an accumulation point at Z naught, so at our essential singularity. So what exactly is an accumulation point or point of accumulation or cluster point or whatever? It's a point in your set. So let's say this is your set over here. Let's say this is some set um, and you have an accumulation point, let's say right over here. So there's this guy over here, maybe that's your accumulation point. Now, what is your accumulation point of this set? Let's just call it S for example. It's a point where for any open neighborhood you form around that point, there's always going to be points in S which are contained inside of this neighborhood. So you can make this neighborhood as small as you want around that accumulation point, but you're always going to hit points inside of S. That's what an accumulation point is. And yeah, for example, this point right over here, that's not an accumulation point. Even though this neighborhood contains points in S, I can make it small enough such that it avoids points in S. So that's on a point of accumulation. So what happens if our set EC has a point of accumulation at exactly Z naught? So if this is true over here, then we're basically done. Because what are we trying to show? We're trying to show that every single neighborhood of our essential singularity has some point Z which maps to well, exactly C. But if Z0 isn't an accumulation point, well, that means that for every single neighborhood of Z0, there's going to be points in EC. So since every single neighborhood of Z0 contains a point in EC, so there exists a, a Z in that well, specific neighborhood, um, could be anything really, such that F of Z is exactly equal to C, but if F of Z is equal to C, then that just means that, yeah, 
and mod of f of z minus c, um, this is less than epsilon automatically because the difference is exactly zero. So if z not an accumulation point, then there's nothing too interesting more to show. So what we're going to do is assume that um, ec does not have an accumulation point at z naught. So if z naught is not a point of accumulation. So if z0 is not a point of accumulation, then what happens? Then there's going to exist some delta greater than zero, such that your disk, so let's say d star at z0 with a radius delta, if you intersect it with ec, this is going to be equal to, yeah, empty set. And yeah, there, now there could be neighborhoods where if you take the intersection, it's non-empty, so, I mean, maybe you take this neighborhood of Z0 over here and it contains some points in EC. Um, I mean, that's a good thing because then we're done once again because there's points in your neighborhood which maps to exactly C, which is, yeah, that's what we wanted pretty much. But there's also going to be neighborhoods where this is not the case, where there, you can find some kinds of delta where this neighborhood, this disk over here, doesn't contain these points in EC. But if this happens over here, then this is equivalent to saying, um, so this is equivalent to saying, for all numbers z in the disk d star, in the puncture disk d star z naught comma delta, f of z is not equal to c because you're not hitting any points in ec over here. But if f of z is not equal to yeah, c, then this is equivalent to saying f of z minus c is not equal to zero. So you subtract on both sides. But notice one thing, this is equivalent to saying, well, one over f of z minus c, because it's never gonna be equal to zero, we can divide and this function that we get must be holomorphic. So it's going to be yeah, defined everywhere and you can definitely differentiate it. Well, at least on this open puncture disk. Okay, so if this guy is holomorphic, um, then we're gonna use this fact to our advantage. What we're going to do is we're going to define some new function g of z. So let g of z, um, let's define this guy to be exactly one over f of z and then minus c. And the idea is from here is to use the fact that g is holomorphic on this disk, this open puncture disk, and derive some properties of g of z. And if we know something about g of z, well, we definitely know something about f of z. Because from this equation, what we can say is, well, f of z, that's just going to be equal to, if we rearrange things a bit over here, that's just going to give you 1 over g of z, and then plus c. So if we use this function g of z here, what we can do is we can reframe what we wanted to show. So we've picked some delta over here. We've picked this delta. And what we can do is we can fix epsilon now. So now we're going to fix epsilon greater than zero. So we fixed these two guys. We've gotten this disk that's holomorphic. And what we want to do is we want to show that there exists a z in that disk where f of z minus c is less than delta. Um, but this statement over here, notice that's just equivalent to show that g of z, so modulus of g of z, um, while well, this is going to be greater than epsilon because g of z, that's just the reciprocal of that guy over here. So if you can show that g of z is greater than epsilon, then we're basically done pretty much. So to proceed from here, we're just going to use contradiction. So I'm going to rub out this blackboard here and we'll keep going. So by contradiction, what we're going to do is we're going to suppose that on this disk um, d star z naught delta, we're going to suppose that the absolute value of g of z, but we wanted to show it was greater than epsilon, right? We're just going to suppose the opposite. So suppose this guy was a less than or equal to, by the way, I just realized this is supposed to be greater than 1 over epsilon because we're taking reciprocals up there. Silly me. So you want to suppose that g of z is less than or equal to 1 over epsilon. And the idea is, if we suppose this, then g of z naught, we're going to show that g of z naught is actually defined. And if z of g of z naught is actually defined, that means that z naught cannot be an essential singularity, which is the contradiction we kind of want. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, because the g of z is holomorphic on this open disk, 
um, that's punctured as well, we can consider the Laurent series expansion of our function g of z. Um, so we can say g of z is exactly going to be equal to the sum running from n is equal to negative infinity to infinity of a n z minus z naught. So z naught, this is the points we're kind of centered around here, and this is raised to the n. And what's the formula for a n? Well, that's the Laurent's coefficients formulas. Um, I don't think I've made a video on that actually, maybe I should. So a n, that's just going to be 1 over 2 pi i, and then you have the integral, um, and you're integrating, this is a contour integral, over the circle z minus z naught um, is equal to some radius r of your function, so g of z divided by, um, well, z minus z naught, but you raise it to the n plus 1. And then we have a dz to finish off there. And in particular, this r here, this r, it's going to be bounded between yeah, zero and delta because you have your, this, your delta over here and you can only integrate to where your function is analytic, roughly speaking. Okay, so what did we want to show before? We wanted to show that g was well defined and the only way we can do that is show that there's no negative powers in this Laurent series expansion. So here's the trick over here. What we're gonna do is we're going to take a look at the negative coefficients or the negative, the a negative numbers here. So for n less than zero, let's see what we can do here. I'm going to bound these a n. So first of all, notice that zero is less than or equal to the absolute value of a n. That's straightforward. Okay, but a n, this is just this integral here, and this is going to be the absolute value of this integral. And in particular, what we can do is we can use the ml bound over here. So ml bound, that's something I've proved on this channel, so I don't need to kind of rewrite it here. So this is equal to, well, first of all, the absolute value of one over two pi i, that's just going to be one over two pi. So this is less than or equal to, so um, here we're using the ml bound. So it's one over two pi, then we have m times l. So what exactly is m? m is just the maximum value that our function on the inside there can take on the path that we're integrating along. So m, that's just going to be, well, the maximum along z minus z naught is equal to r of g of z, I um, mean absolute values, and we might as well split the absolute values from the top and the bottom. So we have z minus z naught, and this is raised to the n plus one. So this guy over here, this is the m in the ml bound, and what's the l going to be? Well, l that's just going to be the length of the path we're integrating, well, that's just the circle with a radius of r, so that's just going to be 2 pi r. So this guy over here, this is the l in the ml bound. Okay, so now notice there's a 2 pi, that's nice. So this 2 pi, this can cancel out with this 2 pi over here. Um, and also notice one nice thing, we have a z minus z naught in absolute values. So this is z minus z naught in absolute values, this is going to be equal to exactly r, because that's the radius on our contour integration path. So what we can do is we can rewrite this a little bit, so this is going to be equal to now, the two pi's are gone, what are we left with? We're left with, well, this is going to be r to the n plus one, um, so we have r divided by r to the n plus one, that's just going to leave us with one over r to the n left over there. Okay, and then what else do we have? We have the maximum at of z minus z naught is equal to r of our function g of z in absolute values. But here's the thing, notice that's the absolute value of g of z, we assumed that was less than or equal to one over epsilon. So this whole entire thing here is less than or equal to um, one over, we have r to the n times epsilon. And another thing we could do because n is negative, we can just rewrite this as, for example, r to the absolute value of n divided by epsilon. Um, because we can flip this up because the power is negative, but then we just have to put in, um, absolute values here. Okay, so in particular, what did we show? We just showed that we have a zero less than or equal to a n, but this is less than or equal to r to the n divided by epsilon. And here's the thing, this inequality here, this must hold for any value of r we pick, because r, well that's between zero and delta, right? This must hold for any 
and all values of r in this range here. And because r could get arbitrarily close to zero, that means this term over here, um, on the right hand side, this can get arbitrarily close to zero. Um, so by the um, Sweet's theorem or something, we can argue that the modulus of a n, um, that must be equal to zero for all n less than zero. So what we've shown here is that there's no negative terms or no negative powers. Now, if there's no negative powers in our Laurent series expansion, what does that mean? It means that G is holomorphic at Z naught. So G is hollow at Z naught. So at the essential singularity of our function F. Okay, so this is, this is huge over here. Let's actually finish it on this blackboard here, why not? So what did we show? We just showed that if the modulus of g of z, if this guy was less than or equal to 1 over epsilon, then g is holomorphic at exactly z naught. So why is this important? It was because, remember from the previous blackboard, maybe I wrote it somewhere, our function f of z can be written as 1 over g of z plus c. So let's just recall that over here. f of z can be written, be written as 1 over g of z and then plus c. So there's a few cases over here. What happens, so the first case, what happens if a g of z naught is not equal to zero? So it's a finite number not equal to zero. Then what happens? That means we can plug z naught into here and f is going to be defined. So that means f is also going to be holomorphic at z naught. Or in other words, um, you can say that z naught is a removable singularity. But this is a problem because this is a contradiction to the fact that z naught, we assumed that was an essential singularity. Okay, and what's the other case? Well, the other case is precisely if a g of z naught is equal to zero. Then what happens with our function f? It turns out that you're going to get 1 over 0, which is undefined, but 1 over, well, 0, that's infinity. And remember from the previous video, if your function approaches infinity, um, that means your function has a pole at exactly that point. So f has a finite order pole at z naught, which again, this is a big contradiction. And yeah, by the way, poles have to be finite orders. They can't be infinite orders because if you take the reciprocal, then your reciprocal function must have an infinite order zero, which doesn't really make sense. Um, the only infinite order zero you could get is if your function is the zero function itself. But yeah, these are the only two cases um, and they both lead to contradictions. So what went wrong over here is because we supposed that g of z was less than or equal to 1 over epsilon. So this assumption here, um, that gave us trouble. So therefore, modulus of g of z, this guy had to be greater than 1 over epsilon. But this tells us, well this is equivalent to saying um, f or modulus of f of z minus um, c, this is less than epsilon. And this is exactly what we wanted to show because we fixed a delta, we fixed an epsilon, um, and then we had some holomorphic disk over there, and we pick a point c in our complex plane that we want to kind of map to, and we showed that we must be able to get arbitrarily close to this complex number of a choosing. So this wraps up the proof for Cassarati Weierstrass theorem. So that was, well, this is quite a long recording session, that's why I had to split it up into two videos. But yeah, that's a pretty cool theorem. Don't know if I'm going to be proving the Picard theorems anytime soon, or maybe like in a few years once I'm, yeah, mathematically mature enough to prove such things. Um, but yeah, I think this is going to be good enough for now. And we'll do a couple of videos which actually depends on Cassarati Weierstrass, which is why I wanted to do these series of videos here. So yeah, that's all for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, make sure you subscribe and not not if you wanna see more complex analysis um, and yeah, stuff that uses this Cassarati virus trust thing. So yeah, that's all for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed. Up until the next one, hope you guys have a wonderful day and I'll see everyone in the next one. Bye bye.